All right, let's get into a couple of players. I want to ask you about a couple of guys um, because it's so hard to see kind of how different guys are doing unless the ball goes their way or unless you happen to watch them on, um, you know, specific route or whatever. Um, but a couple of guys that I think are worth talking about. One, obviously, is is Jaden Daniels, and that will wind up hitting on some of the offense, uh, you know, other offensive guys, I'm sure. But um, anything that stood out for Jaden with the pads on? Because there was, there was a couple of muddy pockets today. Like, there was some times where he had to move a little bit bit had to adjust there's guys around his feet like that hasn't happened yet how do you think he handled it and what did you see from Daniels on day one of pads um you know I, I was pretty impressed it's hard to tell not having the clicker like what the pocket actually looks like because that's when you make some of those decisions but uh, there was a couple where I was like man I love how quick he is in the pocket how decisive he is and he's not ever really looking to run which is such a interesting contrast to like Marcus Mariota who is always it's like I'm a little frenetic. I'm pulling the ball to run, and he's had some really nice scrambles. So I'm not saying that like that's a bad thing. It's just different. It's a different philosophy of playing the position, and um, I think that's been really cool. And again, like with pads on, throwing windows are tighter. Like today, for example, you know they're in this kind of like flat contour defensively. Looks like they're bringing some type of pressure, man coverage, and Jane does a great job of identifying his matchup, losing a little ground in the pocket, and throwing the ball on time to Zach. There's a little bit of tug by the receiver or by the DB, which is Jeremy Chin. Not 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 egregious, but it's a tug, and it's incomplete. But I love again that he understood that he was getting pressure. He understood that he's getting man. He fell away in the pocket the right way, bought enough time to give Zach an opportunity to win. And again, I think being maybe this is my tight end bias. I think Zach won, right? And I think it's you know defenses are holding bastards, but that's fine. And. <laughs> And, um, and, uh, you no know, like, no but, bias. but all of those things check boxes, you know, I know what we're doing. I know where the ball should go. I've identified my matchup and I know how to get the ball there and w minus the tug. It's probably a completion. So, um, I love that. I love that about him. And I love the, I love the red zone period. I thought he just knew again, like Cliff did a good job of kind of bouncing into some really subtle formational things that we can't talk about too detailed on the podcast, but they were designed to affect the defense in a very specific way. And you could tell Jaden knew what they were trying to affect and where the ball should go. And I love that because he's not holding the ball a long time, which is awesome. So yeah. um, love those little wrinkles, love that little pixie dust. But the thing, the more telling thing out of that is that the quarterback understands what what the result should be. And I think that's pretty cool. And it, there's just, there's just, it's kind of a constant thing with him. You know, like every time you think he's going to get tripped up by something, he just kind of meets the challenge, which is pretty cool. And I think today with the pads on, like you were saying, with some of those muddy pockets, with some of those difficult looks, I thought, again, the foot speed in the pocket, the understanding, the anticipation was all there. Yeah. I, so on that front, like two things on Jaden and Cliff, I'll start with the Cliff thing because we're here. One thing you hear a lot around the league is like, can the quarterback get a clear picture? And I think what you just described is Cliff's ability to do that for his quarterbacks. Because right. Cliff's got a great reputation for being able to do that. Of like, He gives the quarterbacks a very clean picture with clean reads. And, and I think part of that is knowing exactly what you're looking at. And I think back to our interview a couple, you know, two years ago now or whatever it was, maybe it was before last year with Matt Ryan, where Matt talked about how as his career went and defenses shifted and changed, like those pictures became muddier and muddier. But he eventually found ways to like look in the right place and understand, okay, I don't need to know what coverage it is. I just need to know where that guy is mm. and i feel like what you're describing is cliff having an ability to with formation with personnel with whatever it is in this case uh formation to clear up that picture a little bit and be like hey man i don't really care what coverage they're in i just need you to know where this guy is and if he goes there you throw there and if he goes here you throw there and if you can get that clarity for a quarterback and get to your quarterback in the meeting room this is the clarity that you are looking for, which is two different things, right? It's one thing to create it schematically, like win with the pen. It's another to translate that knowledge of exactly what to look for to the players. And I think at times we've seen that. I think we've seen, you know, some games in the last couple of years where we've gone back and, and watched the tape and, you know, you'll point out something to me on, on a specific play and be like, EB did a great job of getting this guy open or Scott did a great job of getting this guy open. And we're going, what's the quarterback looking at? And so the 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 same pageness of hey quarterback you know one you're getting the look two quarterback is looking for that thing 
with regularity speaks to both Cliff's ability to do that and Jaden's ability to to take in that information and, and ultimately use it. Yeah, no, I think that's 100 percent right, and it, and it's still early in training camp, obviously, and you For know sure. we're still we're still early with Jaden, and you, we don't know where the defense is in terms of install. We don't know where Cliff's Cliff is in terms of install. We don't really know what Cliff's motivation is with regards to install, but all those things you just said, I think, are 100 percent true. It's like this is this is the kind of window dressing, and there's something very, I guess, like you know what I would associate like with the West Coast offense this this nuance of formation that you didn't see necessarily, again, you don't see it in college from Cliff. You saw it a little bit in Arizona, but to see it in practice, you're like, man, this guy gets football. You know, like there was a touchdown to McNichols the other day and um, there was like, it wasn't anything complicated, but basically like the defense didn't pass it off correctly and the back's wide open. I'm like, that's great. And it's all it is, is a little bit of emotion gets them in a formation. They're not exactly sure who, who's got who, what's, and they, they lose the back and like, that's all it is. And so, um, I've been really pleased with that element of it. I've been pleased with where they're at with that. And hopefully that continues. And hopefully every single week they just keep building off of that. And it's awesome that they can do that because the quarterback showing like to your point that he understands and that he's smart enough to handle it. And, um, and I know we've been talking a lot about Jaden, but there's been times where I'm like, Hey, that's, Good job by Marcus Mariota or Sam Hartman yeah. understanding the same principle. You know, Jeff Driscoll, I think, made a play today that was pretty impressive. Same type of thing. And, you know, those latter two guys, Sam Hartman and Jeff Driscoll, are dealing with worse offensive lines. So that becomes a little bit messy for them. But I think on the whole, like, however Cliff has chosen to teach it, um, however Johnson has uh, kind of supported him in terms of teaching to Vita, like, you know, one of the things we were wondering about is, like, how does this – how do they put a scaffolding around the quarterback position? And so far, again, it's only been six practices. It seems like they've done a great job of of building that scaffolding for that position group. Yeah, in red zone today, there's like a couple of wide open touchdowns. And like that wide open. speaks like to silly wide obvious, open. Yeah. yeah. Like obviously Joe Witt Jr. is gonna be like, that's us messing up, but it tells you the conflict that the defense is in and um, you know, hopefully Joe and, and his staff can get that cleaned up uh, for on the defensive side. That's the that's the uh, the positive and the negative. The double edged sort of training camp is like, oh man, great job offense, way to go, Cliff, love this. Oh crap, the defense is having trouble with it. Like they're, that's just kind of how it goes. And um, but fair, Cliff, like Cliff did it frequently enough that you're like, man, Cliff's clearly. I don't know what it is. You know, you you. It's clearly have a better idea of it. Um, you know, I'm watching at it. Just you know, you want to, whether it's because I don't know what it is. Period. Uh, if, even if you show me the tape, I don't know the names, the concepts, whatever. Um, but also times like you're watching the O line, all of a sudden a dude's just wide open, and you're like, well, that seems to it seems to have accomplished what it was supposed to do. Yeah, and, and to be fair, like you know, they they've done the offense is putting some stuff in that you're like. I understand why this is challenging. It, it's designed to stress defenses and man-to-man coverage, right? And it's designed to have answers versus certain zone coverages. And if that's all the defense has in at the moment, then that's going to favor the offense. Right. So, again, like training camp has ebbs and flows. Three days from now, I bet you the defense is ahead of the curve, and you're like, what the heck's wrong with the offense? Like, that's just how it's going to go. You know what I'm saying? Like, they are going to catch up with install-wise. They're going to start matching concepts better. And – the defense is going to look like awesome. And that ha- that's happened in every single training camp I've been a part of. I will also say that I've been super impressed defensively with how confident those guys are playing in the back end. You know, like I know they've had some miscues or whatever in the, in the low red, especially like I will say this as an offensive coordinator, like at the high school level. So obviously not in the same vein as them. If you're going to play man to man in the red zone, like I, as a, and I, as a coordinator, I know that I should win. And so Cliff Kingsbury did win, and that's important. But in the other stuff, I think those guys in the back end have done a great job of of communicating and playing fast. So credit to Joe Witt Jr. But I, yeah, like you said, I think coming out of today, like in, specifically in that red zone period, you're like, "Ooh, this is this is good," it's good and stuff. it's and it's and it's good stuff. So yeah, um, best play of the day. Just random shout out real quick before we get on to some of the other guys. Sam Hartman had a ball and not in the red zone um, in in elevens where he just ripped one to Jamison Crowder on the sideline. That was ridiculous. Like, escaped the rush, rolled out, like, had to be perfect, was perfect. So, salute, shout out to Sam Hartman. Good job on that one. Um, other things to to talk about, um, other guys to talk about. John Dotson. Um, mm. I was asked about him this morning when I was on with the Junkies, and I feel like he's had a bit of a quiet camp so sure. far, production-wise. What have you seen from him when you've watched him, though? Like, is this just... 
a odd stretch where the ball is going somewhere else? Like, is he not doing things he needs to do? Like, what what have we seen from Jahan Dotson so far? Yeah, I think that's it's a tough question because, like, you know, when I'm watching, I'm kind of doing multiple things. I'm watching the concept, so I'm trying to figure out who's in. So I or watch in formation, figure out who's in, where they're lined up, and watching concept. And so I will say, I haven't really been focused on Jahan in that way, and. But like it kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about before, like when you're evaluating people at camp, like are they making plays? And he's been kind of quiet. So uh, I don't know how much he's been in. You know what I'm saying? Which again, like right. that might be a decision from the staff. Like I would imagine that you know that those comments about oh I wish I would have had 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 a few more plays are coming from older players, more veteran players. Because I will say, Dan, at least in my experience, knows how to kind of say. This is going to be our team, the nucleus of our team. These guys, we know what they are. We understand they need reps, but like, when do they need reps? Who Who is it more important that gets reps? The guys we don't know about or the guys we do know about? And so I think that that's also playing into this. Like, it'd be really interesting to go back if we could and tally reps for Jahan and Terry and, you know, whoever else, Luke McCaffrey or B-Rob, for example. And I'm sure you'd be like, man, they're actually not getting – that many reps or as many reps as like Bryson for Tremaine sure. or somebody like that. For sure. They're way more even than in the right. past. Like traditionally we've talked about this already in this podcast, like first teamers would get like eight reps, second teamers would get like six reps. And then the third teamers would get four reps. If there was time left on the clock this year, it's like two reps rotate, two reps rotate, two yeah. reps rotate. And as the drill goes, those top line guys don't necessarily rotate Correct. back in as frequently. And so you might get two and then two and then you're out where Tremaine might get two, two, one, out, one, out, one, out. And yeah. like a guy like Tremaine winds up getting more reps than a guy like Terry. Yeah, because that's the thing I was going to say, like Bryson Tremaine, Casimir Allen, um, you know, name your receiver. Even OZ has to get that many. But those two guys in particular, I feel like they're in almost every play. And I think part of it is because Bryson Tremaine is playing – X, Z, F, and sometimes he's playing the Y in four wide receiver sets. So he's in, especially when they get out of that first group, like a lot. Kazmir Allen's in there a lot. And um, and so, I again, like Jahan hasn't been super noticeable. But I think part of that is just because like, are those guys playing that much? It doesn't feel like it at the moment. And that seems like a conscious decision. Yeah, for sure. I think the other guy that I'm surprised has been a little quiet because he had a louder spring is Luke. McCaffrey. Yeah, I was about to say he kind of falls in that same bucket for me too. It's the same thing yeah. with a couple of those guys. Like, you know, like Luke was a guy I was expecting to have a great. Not that he's having a bad training camp, but a louder right. training camp. Um, you know, uh, Dominique uh, 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 Hamilton is that right? Hamilton? Hampton, yeah, Hampton, excuse safety. me, yeah. Dominique Hampton. Like I thought he'd be louder. Mike Sanders, was, I thought would be louder. But again, that doesn't mean they're playing badly. It just means that they haven't flash the same way and the rotation might be different now you know like with some of these guys so um again it's hard to kind of keep track of everybody because like i've been watching brandon coleman i've been watching ben sinnett i've been watching tyler owens on defense because he's a guy that's yeah. got my eye quite a bit and so your eye tends to gravitate towards i like watching bryson tremaine i think he does a great job so my eye tends to gravitate towards those players that doesn't mean that those other guys are having a bad camps. So I just don't have enough file on it to give you like a the, the the listener an accurate commentary on where exactly they're at. Right, and that's how I feel feel as well. And that's why I was like, am I missing something? Um, yeah. But it does. It, that has been kind of the interesting thing about a guy like Dotson is like there Terry has been more involved, even though their reps are probably pretty similar because there does seem to be a concerted effort when he's in to get him the ball. Right. And, you know, we talked about that last late last week, especially with Marcus, where there was like that one drive where he just force fed Terry the ball like right. five straight plays on Emmanuel Forbes and and Forbes did a good job uh on most of them, but Terry got a deep on him one time. Um, and had another catch, I think, in that sequence as well. But with Jahan, there just hasn't been that same thing, and he's not getting a ton of reps. And so uh, ultimately, the result is a fairly quiet camp. And I, I just think that's interesting and something to watch is uh, this shifts because there will be parts of this camp that are, let's get ready for the season. There'll be parts right. of this camp that are like, let's get ready for the preseason games. Because, you know, to your point, if Dan understands like who his main guys are and just wants them to get ready for the season, part of the evaluation process is the preseason games. Like that's actually a huge deal. How do you actually play football? Right. And so you want to make sure that you've prepared these end of roster guys for those games. That way they can go out and put forth their best effort and you're evaluating them based off that, not based off your own failures to prepare them. 
Yeah, I mean, when I was with Dan in Atlanta, like one of the things that really stuck out to me was this idea that um, he knew the roster really well. He had it established from the jump. And so like in the third preseason game, if he knew you were going to make the team, and I think this was also him and Dimitrov like working through some stuff, you didn't play. So they'd go walk out there with like, you know, how many guys on the roster? Like 40 guys. And they were like, good luck. You're playing the whole time. If you, if you were like, I was the second string tight end, third string tight end. I didn't dress wow. my uh, first year there. So they you're obviously pissed too a, because that's your all star game. That's we my all star game. That. That's the first time I haven't dressed in my whole career for that game. Was that was that season? I was just like, whoa, this is pretty cool. Like not to be stressed out and have to worry about this. But it it does show, I think. And you know, Sean McVay started doing this in L.A. There's a lot of coaches that are moving to this model. It's like we know who our guys are. Let's make sure we're. It's not about who's ready for training camp or preseason or joint practice. It's about who's ready for week one. So I do think that that's been a big shift across the league. Now there are still some old school mentalities there, but I do think that that's something to keep an eye on with this group. Is how are they going to handle that? How are they going to handle the workload going into season? And do they ever ramp those guys up at any point and say, "Hey, ones v ones, let's go get it"? And maybe they maybe they save that day for a joint practice or whatever it is. So. Um, Again, when you're looking at practice structure for this team, I think uh, it's informative of the depth chart, informative of philosophy, and it's going to be really interesting to kind of keep an eye on that moving forward. For sure. Uh, you mentioned Tyler Owens. I thought one of the most interesting moments of practice today involved him. Kaz Allen bobbled a ball, and Owens was right there. Ball kind of pops up. Allen's able to catch it. Um, and then Joe Witt Jr. comes right up to Owens as the play is ending, and it's just like, you got to catch that ball, dude. Yeah. Like, and and I just thought, you know, we hear about the emphasizing of turnovers and the details and all this stuff. And you know, we talked last week about some of the different ways that this staff does it compared to other staffs that claim to do it. Um, but I thought that was a tremendous example of like, oh, when Joe Hitt says he's serious about the ball, if you squander an opportunity, he is going to make sure you know that that was an opportunity. Yeah, and I think it also does a couple of things, that 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 little interaction. One, I think it shows you the type of camp Tyler Owens is having so far. He's a big guy, he's fast with the football, he's been very he's been more instinctive than his college film showed. Um, but then I think you're getting so Joe Witt's gonna coach him up and be like, Hey man, let's make sure that ball comes out. But also I think to your point, it speaks to a you know, like people talk about we're about the ball, but like that is how you become about the ball. Every opportunity you have when the ball is in the air, when it's a 50-50 ball, you emphasize why that's important. And I think the eagerness, the, the the zest that he showed coming up to him, he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was angry, but he was just like, come on, like, like, like this is it. Like, that's the moment. That's the one. That's the game-changing play. And for a young player to hear that, and you know that's going to come up in the team meeting. They're going to pull that clip and show that and be like, hey, man, like, way to click and close on this, but let's finish this play and get that ball out and – that either that's an incomplete pass or it's an interception or it's a fumble. Like let's make that happen for us. And I think like, again, like one of the things that Kyle always did when I was in San Fran in 2017, 2016, whatever year that was 18, gosh, they're all bleeding together now, (laughs) but we'd pull clips from practice and be like, this should be a pick. This should be a fumble. This should be whatever. And you're like, Oh, like that's what we're doing. And it really makes you as an offensive player aware of it. And as a defensive player, you're aware of it too. And I just thought that was, like, to your point, just a cool moment, good energy, positive. But, hey, man, this is who we are. This is who we want to be. Let's make it happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, any other guys you want to talk about? Anybody else? I mean, Jamin, again, playing out on the edge. I didn't see him work with the linebackers at all again today. Yeah. There's a chance I missed something. But I feel like he's he's out on the edge now. And um, I can't say it's going great for him. Yeah, um, it's, you know, and it's just it's, one of those it's things. It's hard, man. It's, it's really hard. And again, you've said this, and I agree. I like him as a mover. I like him the way he moves, the way he gets off the football. He could probably do it. It's just, it's such a nuanced thing to do. And it's such a short window. Like today, he had like this really nice get off. And Coleman did a great job kind of covering up the angle. So it's like, if this is if this is the rusher, right? And you're in the screen's the quarterback, the tackle just set right in front of it. So as a rusher, your job is to like get to an edge, figure something out. And Jamin, like you could just tell his brain was like, what do I do? Like, and that's hard for rushers. And that takes a long time to cult- to, to cultivate that secondary reaction. So he ends up just running right into him. And Coleman does a great job. Everyone's talked about his balance and his feet, just settles it down, does a great job. But that to me shows 
again, like the athleticism's there, the get offs there, but it's that the it's like when you're playing jazz music, right? And you just mm. can play. Like it's not quite there for him yet, and it takes a long time to do that. And I think Coach Tapp, I've seen him kind of pull him off to the side. I've seen Ryan Kerrigan pull him off to the side. And I think they're coaching him and approaching him in the right way. It just you just gotta feel it out in a way that is is challenging to do. And again, they're doing the same thing with Jordan McGee, but Jordan McGee is also playing off ball linebackers. So it's this it's this really interesting situation for Jay Moore. They're like, We've identified your role. Let's make it work, as opposed to McGee, who's got a little bit, who's got more more irons in the fire, more flexibility, seemingly for the defense, and has a better contract. Like he's he was drafted by this yeah. unit this year. Like he's worth investing in over time. Jamin is on the final year of his deal, um, so it's it's tough sledding for him. Um, having traits is not enough. There's been a lot of guys that have played a yeah. lot more football on the edge that have similar traits as Jamin Davis. I mean, Jamin's pretty special traits wise. So at least have most of the traits of Jamin Davis and they're not NFL edge rushers. And it's just, it's a, to do this at this point in his career is really, really hard. And again, like we're talking about what we see here. I think both of us liked how Jamin finished the year last year at linebacker, but yeah. clearly they didn't see what they needed to to continue with him there. They have other people. Um, but then again, weird stuff happens in training camps and who knows? Uh, so a long way to go. And we'll uh, continue to talk about it as we get more data and everything plays out. So uh, that's going to do it for our show today. Tuesday, more practice. Wednesday, off day. So Logan and I are going to take in practice on Tuesday. And then Wednesday morning, I think, is the plan to kind of recap it uh, and and see where we are after the first two padded practices. Uh, And then next week, uh, more take command. Uh, Denton Day will be in for me while I am gone in Paris, uh, headed to the Olympics with my wife. Uh, So that'll be a lot of fun if you want to, you know, Actually, I'm not. I'm not working at all. So I was gonna say, if you want to like see no. tweets about people running in circles, go somewhere else. Because I'm not. <laughs> I'm just. I'm gonna go enjoy myself. Uh, but take command's not going anywhere. Denton is awesome. Uh, you guys know him from the Kevin Sheehan show, and he'll be in with Logan, uh, recapping the practices while I'm gone, and then. We're back to it right after the preseason game. I'll be back for that. Uh, and Logan and I will do a recap show on the day after uh, the Commanders open their preseason. So that's kind of what you can expect. Uh, so we'll see you Wednesday morning for another edition of Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.